Hey there, this is Ari Witten with the Energy Blueprint. And in this presentation, I have something very special for you. This is something that has been a, a huge amount of work to put together, many, many months. Uh, and I'm very, very excited to share this with you. This is about debunking adrenal fatigue and showing you the true causes of low cortisol. Now, this is a topic I've had a huge interest in for several years now. And it's been something that I've been really passionate about sharing in the past uh, and something that I've done what I believe is the most comprehensive review of the scientific literature around this whole topic that anyone has done and that is available on the internet. Now, I've already done one really comprehensive piece on this, and it's called Is Adrenal Fatigue Real? And that's really an examination of the link specifically between adrenal dysfunction and cortisol levels and fatigue very specifically. In this presentation, I want to do something that includes that, but also goes beyond it. And I want to talk about the whole concept of this idea of adrenal fatigue that is still very prevalent in many functional medicine, holistic medicine, and holistic health, alternative health circles. And I want to take you step by step through the actual evidence that tests this theory, that, that puts this general concept of adrenal fatigue to the test so that we can do this in a very systematic, evidence-based way and actually assess the validity of this theory, which has become so popular by looking at the actual evidence that tests it. So part one, this first presentation that you're listening to now is going to be all about the evidence testing adrenal fatigue. And then part two, which I'm also going to be releasing along with this, is another whole presentation that is related to this, but instead of just testing and debunking the whole concept of adrenal fatigue, that presentation is going to go over all of the specific factors that are actually linked with low cortisol levels. So I'm gonna present all of this information to you in a, a very stepwise, very systematic way where we're gonna look at all these different layers of the evidence and put the pieces together. So stick with me. My goal here is to, for anybody who currently is under the impression that they have adrenal fatigue or is a practitioner, who believes in adrenal fatigue and diagnoses people with adrenal fatigue, my goal here is to show you what the evidence actually says so that hopefully we can start to change the paradigm and stop chasing after factors that aren't the real drivers of the problem and start to develop a new paradigm where we actually can address the real root causes of these symptoms. And one more quick thing I want to mention before we get into this. Uh, this was originally a massive, massively long presentation when I first did it. So I've had to cut down a lot of the details and nuances and the very, very detailed analysis of each individual study. And I'm showing you kind of the faster summarized version of this. But if you want to see all the details and you want to see all the references to the specific studies and see even more studies than what I'm going to show you in this presentation here in this summarized version, you can go to theenergyblueprint.com forward slash low dash cortisol dash levels. So energyblueprint.com low cortisol levels uh, with a dash between each one of those words, low cortisol levels. So that article is a really, really comprehensive article covering all of this same information but even more in depth with many more studies and all the links to the actual studies and screenshots of the actual studies, the conclusions and results from each study all posted there. So again, for those of you who want to see all the evidence and analyze all the studies for yourself, it's all posted publicly and freely available. With that in mind, let's first just present the whole big picture of what's going on here. There is a really prevalent idea that has now been indoctrinated into the minds of millions and millions of people who have come to associate fatigue and stress-related fatigue, stress-related burnout and exhaustion with adrenal fatigue. In a lot of people's minds, these two things are synonymous. And if people have the symptoms of fatigue or burnout or any of those kinds of things, many people say, you have adrenal fatigue, your adrenals must be burned out. You have low cortisol, you have adrenal dysfunction, you have HPA axis dysfunction. And these two things for a lot of people have become synonymous. And this is a problem because I'm, as I'm about to show you, these two things are not at all synonymous. The evidence does not support in any way that these two things are synonymous or that these symptoms are actually coming from uh, cortisol issues or adrenal issues or HPA axis issues. I'm gonna take you through this evidence, but I just wanna have you understand the big picture of this before we get into that. So there are thousands of articles online and videos online of people talking about what causes adrenal fatigue and how to fix adrenal fatigue and people trying to fix their fatigue and energy issues by 
fixing their adrenals and doing these various protocols to overcome adrenal fatigue or take adrenal focused supplements and so on. And the tricky part about all this is there's so much misinformation online about this topic of adrenal fatigue that simply has no basis at all in the actual scientific evidence. And unfortunately, there's just far too few people talking about the subject of adrenal fatigue who are actually presenting evidence and the real science talking about this subject. So my goal here is to take you through that. So in this presentation, I want to talk to you about why most people's approach to trying to fix their fatigue is extremely misguided. And there's three basic reasons why I'm doing this. The first is to combat the misinformation and pseudoscience being put out there by so many people around this concept of adrenal fatigue. And two, to show that abnormal cortisol levels and adrenal dysfunction are absolutely not the primary cause of fatigue and burnout and low energy issues and all the other symptoms supposedly caused by adrenal fatigue, things like insomnia and anxiety and depression and so on. And three, to show you the real reasons for low cortisol levels, the real factors that are actually linked with low morning cortisol levels. And there's lots of nuances and myths to debunk as, as you're gonna see throughout this presentation and the next one, and to teach you the simple steps that will allow you to fix your cortisol levels if you actually are one of the portion of people who has any sort of HPA axis dysfunction or low morning cortisol levels. I'm gonna show you the real factors that are responsible for that and how to fix it. And we're gonna go over that in part two, uh, which is the next presentation after this one. So first of all, the general concept of adrenal fatigue is that total body stress load. And this is basically an amalgam of psychological stress, physical stress, chemical, biochemical stress, metabolic stress, any type of stress leads to higher total body stress load, also called allostatic load, basically just the total amount of stressors that your body's under. And that through uh, Hans Selye's research from the 1930s to 1950s, as well as a guy named William Jeffries back in the 80s, maybe 70s, uh, and then later on James Wilson in 1999 with coining the term adrenal fatigue and writing a book called Adrenal Fatigue 21st Century Stress Hormone, basically built out this model of three phases of how stress sort of leads to dysfunction in our body. And at the center of this theory were the adrenal glands, which are glands that sit on top of our kidneys that produce a variety of different hormones, but cortisol in particular is sort of central to this theory. And the idea is that the adrenals are playing an integral role in our stress response system. That part is true. That cortisol is playing an integral role in our stress response. That part is also true. And that total body stress load over time sort of takes our adrenals through three distinct phases. And depending on who you talk to, they break these phases down a little differently. But in general, the, the basic model is three phases of uh, adrenal dysfunction, or sometimes people frame this as HPA axis dysfunction. And the first stage is sort of acute stress, and then you get a surge of cortisol, the body goes into stress response. Over time, as the stress becomes chronic, they say you go into the resistance phase or phase two. And in this phase, cortisol levels could either be normal or high. So you might have high cortisol levels still, or they could be going back down potentially into the normal range. But they say this is still a, a sign of your body sort of being under chronic stress. And then over really prolonged chronic stress, then you get adrenal exhaustion and the adrenal glands are not able to produce enough cortisol to keep up with demands. They get tired, they get burned out. As a result of this adrenal exhaustion and low cortisol levels, you get fatigue, you get other symptoms, insomnia, blood sugar issues, brain fog, low libido, anxiety, depression. These are the symptoms claimed for adrenal fatigue. And you also potentially get various kinds of stress-related chronic diseases. So for many integrative and holistic and functional health practitioners, they see this sort of process of adrenal or HPA axis dysfunction at the heart of not only these symptoms associated with adrenal fatigue, but also many chronic diseases in general. So this is the general model that they're operating under. There are three basic tenets of this theory to put to the test. Number one is that if this theory of adrenal fatigue is true, and there's these three phases of adrenal fatigue, the first basic tenet is that chronic stress should be reliably associated with low cortisol levels. What I mean by that is if we go look to the scientific literature on various kinds of chronic stressors where they have assessed 
cortisol levels in people who are under all sorts of different kinds of chronic stressors, we should see some general pattern that emerges that validates this theory of adrenal fatigue, that validates the idea that over time, chronic stressors reliably tend to result in low cortisol levels. Right, very straightforward way of testing the theory. Number two is chronic disease should be reliably associated with low cortisol levels. And the reason for that is that very simply, if total body stress load, if all the different sort of stressors that the body is under all tend to exhaust the, the adrenals as most holistic and, and integrative and functional medicine practitioners believe, uh, then we should see that chronic disease, things like overt heart disease and obesity and diabetes and, and metabolic syndrome and neurological diseases and cancer and you, know, you name it, all of those things are metabolic stressors and at the very least are associated with metabolic stressors. They themselves are caused by metabolic stressors of various kinds. Any sort of psychological and emotional stress or biochemical stress, there's lots of different stressors that are genuinely linked with those diseases. So we should see that in people who have these sorts of chronic diseases for a very prolonged period of times, we should see also a general pattern that in those people over a prolonged period of time, they tend to have low cortisol levels. And number three, of course, is very central to this adrenal fatigue idea is that chronic fatigue, and we can look to various conditions like burnout syndrome, stress-related exhaustion disorder, which unlike adrenal fatigue actually have uh, evidence on them, there's research that exists, uh, and those conditions, if they look at people with full-blown burnout syndrome or stress-related exhaustion disorder or chronic fatigue of various kinds, they should find when they assess cortisol levels that those people, there is a general association with low cortisol levels, and it's extremely common for those people if they have those symptoms, and those symptoms are supposed to be caused by adrenal burnout and low cortisol levels, we should obviously expect to find that the majority of those people have low cortisol levels. So very straightforward ways of testing this theory of adrenal fatigue. And as I'm about to show you, and I get into much greater details and all of this in the article and in the longer presentations, but as I'm about to show you, all three of these basic tenets are false. They are all not supported by the scientific literature. On every level, every way that is possible to test the adrenal fatigue hypothesis, it is simply not supported by the science. So you're about to see, number one, chronic stress is not associated with low cortisol levels. Chronic disease is not, not associated with low cortisol levels. Low cortisol levels are not reliably associated with the recognized fatigue and burnout syndromes, and therefore the solution to those symptoms of fatigue syndromes that are claimed to be caused by adrenal burnout or adrenal fatigue is not to fix your adrenals or your cortisol levels. And we're also going to talk about what really causes low morning cortisol levels and how to fix low cortisol levels within weeks. Again, the full length article can be found at the energyblueprint.com forward slash low dash cortisol dash levels. So let's get into some of the specifics here. The first basic tenet, as I just said, is to assess the science as to whether chronic stress actually results reliably in low cortisol levels, right? Very, very simple thing. If the adrenal fatigue theory is true, we should obviously expect to find a general association with various kinds of chronic stressors resulting in adrenal fatigue, right? Adrenal burnout and some sign, some indication that the adrenals are being taxed beyond their ability to cope with the stress and that now they're being burnt out and are unable to produce enough cortisol levels. So we should see the pattern of cortisol that gets people diagnosed with adrenal fatigue, right? Well, the problem is that if you actually look to the scientific evidence on this topic and you assess basically any type of chronic stressor that you can think up, there is no clear relationship at all. And if anything, the literature is much, much more strongly in favor that there's a slight elevation of cortisol levels than there is any sort of decrease in cortisol levels. It is almost impossible to find any research that links any type of chronic stressor with low cortisol levels reliably. So I'll take you through a few of these very fast. You can look at different kinds of, of people, groups of people under various kinds of chronic psychological stress or physical stress or biochemical stress, lots of different ways of doing this. So here's an example of chronic psychological and emotional stress. The researcher said, quote, in line with several other recent studies, the present findings again further support the view that cortisol awakening response, that's morning cortisol levels, is consistently enhanced under chronic stress conditions. Consistently enhanced means slightly elevated, 
So, and they go on to talk about other studies, and then they conclude, thus, the association between enhanced cortisol awakening responses, higher morning cortisol levels, and high chronic stress can be regarded as rather consistent. In other words, pretty much all the studies are finding the same thing. Chronic stress from unemployment. What did they find? Compared, compared to employed subjects, unemployed subjects had a diurnal pattern of cortisol excretion with relatively higher morning and lower evening levels. So they had higher morning levels. That's the key time to assess cortisol levels. And what the, the pattern, we're going to talk more about this later, but the pattern that gets people diagnosed with adrenal fatigue is basically low morning cortisol levels and or higher evening cortisol levels. Generally, it's a combination of low morning cortisol levels and either normal or elevated evening cortisol levels. So what they're saying is people who have unemployment stress have higher morning cortisol levels than uh, people who are employed. And there's lots of research that backs it up. Now let's look on the opposite end of the spectrum, chronic stress from work overload. This, these are people who are being chronically too taxed at work and are very stressed from it. What did they find? Results showed that chronically stressed subjects had a significantly larger increase in cortisol compared to unstressed subjects. So again, they're finding that the people under the chronic stress have higher, not lower, cortisol levels. We can also look at metabolic stress from something like cigarette smoking. What did they find? Chronic cigarette smokers was significantly associated with higher, not lower, salivary cortisol release throughout the day. We can also look at overtraining syndrome in athletes. These are athletes who are exercising chronically uh, beyond their body's ability to recover. There's been lots of speculation that this is uh, potentially due to, to cortisol issues. What did they find? They, they assessed, this is a literature review of all of the studies that have been done on the topic. They found that basal levels of hormones were mostly normal in athletes with overtraining syndrome. And they also found that cortisol and plasma catecholamines, things like adrenaline and noradrenaline, were showed conflicting findings. Specifically, they found that four out of the six studies that looked at cortisol levels in athletes with overtraining syndrome showed perfectly normal cortisol levels, not low cortisol levels. What about chronic pain? That's a really great way of assessing chronic stress is if you look at people who've been in chronic pain for years and years and years, they've, they have physical and psychological stress. This is, you know, sort of, you know, severe chronic pain is, is basically as bad of a sort of chronic stressor that you could think of. And what did they find? They found that Hair cortisol contents are increased in patients with major chronic stress. They found an in indication, of course, as many other studies have verified, that cortisol levels are higher, not lower, in people under chronic pain. We can also look at alcohol consumption. So kind of in a similar vein to the cigarette smoking, we can look at people who are subjecting their, their, their bodies to this chronic cellular and metabolic stress of consuming too much alcohol. What do they find? Men who are moderate drinkers are here, Men who are heavy drinkers are here. They have higher cortisol levels uh, the more you drink. Women, same exact thing. Higher cortisol levels the more that they drink. So very consistent. Basically, every type of stressor that you could think of, and this, this just gives you a handful of examples. There's more examples in the, the article. But every type of stressor that you can think of to look up where they've tested cortisol levels in those people under that type of chronic stress shows either normal or elevated cortisol levels. It is extremely rare and uncommon to find any indication of lower cortisol levels. So the idea that chronic stress reliably leads to burnout of the adrenal glands and leads to low cortisol levels is a claim that is absolutely not supported by the evidence. So we have this sort of three phase model of adrenal fatigue and basically what you could make a case for is sort of the first phase and maybe arguably the second phase, though this phase doesn't really say much of anything because it's saying basically that cortisol levels may be high or they may be normal here. And it's, there's, there's essentially no real detectable biomarker or cortisol level that can get you clearly diagnosed as being in phase two of adrenal fatigue. It's sort of, well, it may be high, it may be low, it may be in between. We're not really sure, but still we're going to insist that it, it is phase two adrenal fatigue, even though there's no clear levels of cortisol that actually get you diagnosed as being in phase two. So there, there is potentially evidence you could say for those two, but what there's not evidence for is 
adrenal fatigue, adrenal burnout, this third phase where the adrenals are supposedly getting burnout uh, and they're not able to produce enough cortisol to keep up with the body's stress demands. This is absolutely not supported by the evidence and there is virtually no evidence that someone could find if they're doing an intellectually honest review of the research that supports this. Second, do other conditions and diseases cause low cortisol levels or adrenal fatigue? And basically, if you look at the research here, you find the exact same thing. So I, in the article, I have uh, studies on metabolic syndrome, depression, obesity, heart disease, uh, PTSD, anxiety disorder, schizophrenia, fibromyalgia, bipolar disorder, Hashimoto's, uh, hypothyroidism, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, lots and lots of examples. The only, it is extremely rare, again, to find any type of condition uh, or disease that is reliably associated with low cortisol levels. The only one that you could make a case for is past trauma or childhood abuse. Uh, that's something that is linked to a slightly lower morning cortisol levels, not abnormal low cortisol levels, still within the normal range, but slightly on the lower correlation with lower rather than higher cortisol levels. Every single other disease that you could find either has mixed findings, has normal cortisol levels, or has slightly elevated cortisol levels. It is extraordinarily uncommon to find any disease, even you know people who have had severe, all kinds of different severe chronic diseases for years or decades who have any indication of low cortisol levels. Again, on average, in general, it is either normal or elevated cortisol levels that they find in people with these conditions. So a couple of examples, this is Alzheimer's. The finding in senile Alzheimer patients is that cortisol levels were similar to those of unaffected age match controls. That means similar to people who don't have Alzheimer's of similar age. And then Parkinson's disease, higher diurnal cortisol levels were found in one subset of people with Parkinson's disease, those without, uh, and it's kind of details, but uh, those without impulsive compulsive behaviors. And then in the group with impulsive compulsive behaviors who had Parkinson's disease, there were no differences in cortisol levels in those people with Parkinson's uh, compared to normal healthy people without Parkinson's. You can also look in people with type 2 diabetes. What they find is that cortisol levels are increased, not decreased, and the degree of increase in cortisol levels is related to the presence and number of diabetes complications. So in other words, the more severe the diabetes, the longer it's gone on, the stronger the link gets between higher cortisol levels. There is never a point where they find that it starts to go down and then result in low cortisol levels. Finally, to give one other example here, there's many more that I give in the article, but uh, in Hashimoto's hypothyroidism, which is an autoimmune hypothyroid condition, the most common cause of hypothyroidism. This is a condition that in holistic and functional medicine circles is often claimed to be associated with adrenal fatigue. People who are working on Hashimoto's hypothyroidism often claim that adrenal burnout and, and poor adrenal function is part of this and low cortisol levels is part of this condition and is, is very generally, is very commonly associated with it. And the only research that exists on this topic that has actually looked at cortisol levels in people with Hashimoto's has found increased cortisol levels, not decreased cortisol levels. So basically everywhere you look, every type of disease that you can think up with very, very, very few exceptions, I would say 95% of the diseases that have been tested where they've looked at cortisol levels show either normal or high cortisol levels. It is extremely uncommon to find any indication of lower cortisol levels. So again, going back to this sort of three phase model of adrenal fatigue, there is simply no support for this idea of the third phase of adrenal burnout, adrenal fatigue, adrenal exhaustion. This idea that over time, chronic stress, chronic disease, total body stress load or allostatic load, any sort of measure of any amalgam of all of the stressors, and you can look at all sorts of different kinds of stressors, every, every place that you look for different kinds of chronic stressors or chronic diseases or anything that you can think up simply does not support this idea of adrenal fatigue that the adrenals are getting burnt out by chronic stress and not able to produce enough cortisol to keep up with the body's demands. Finally, the key question, more directly speaking to this idea of adrenal fatigue, the, the sort of condition and the specific symptoms that are claimed for that, is low cortisol levels or poor adrenal function the cause of fatigue and burnout and stress-related exhaustion? So first of all, there's an important distinction that I want to make here. If you go to PubMed.com, which is sort of like Google for scientific studies, or you go to Google Scholar, which is uh, the, the portion of Google 
it's, it's sort of like you do a Google image search or you do a, um, a Google video search. You can also do a Google Scholar search. It's a subset of Google where it only brings up the scientific research on that topic, the actual science. So it leaves out all the sort of general articles that, that are found on the internet and is specifically about the research. So if you do a search on either of those two places for searching scientific research, and you do a search for adrenal fatigue, you put it in quotation so it tells, it tells PubMed that you specifically wanna look up research on that exact condition, adrenal fatigue, and you look at what you find, Basically, what you will find is that there is literally no research in existence on the topic of adrenal fatigue. There is no research that has actually validated this concept of adrenal fatigue. And in fact, the only things that you'll find are basically, you know, there's like one study where they had a questionnaire that they titled it a adrenal fatigue questionnaire. And they sort of, they just sat people down and asked them questions and said, do you have this symptom? Do you have that symptom? And they, they titled this, or this uh, questionnaire an adrenal fatigue questionnaire. And then the only other things that you'll find is a few random mentions of it, not really in any research, but mainly what you'll find is actually debunkings of adrenal fatigue. And, and uh, in particular, people doing research reviews saying that the evidence does not support the concept of adrenal fatigue, sort of like what I'm doing here. Uh, given that, how can we even sort of talk about the science on adrenal fatigue? You know, if, if there's no evidence to even look at in the first place, we're sort of, you know, we're sort of at a full stop. There's really nowhere to go. Well, that is unfortunately the, the position that we were in for a long time. However, the big breakthrough is that there are a couple other conditions which are basically synonymous with the general idea of adrenal fatigue that are actually in the scientific literature and that there are dozens of studies on where they've looked specifically at the relationship of these fatigue syndromes and cortisol levels. So burnout syndrome and stress-related exhaustion disorder are the main ones. There's also vital exhaustion. There's also maybe not directly related to the concept of adrenal fatigue or partially related is chronic fatigue syndrome, but certainly very synonymous sort of way with the idea of adrenal fatigue, the idea that chronic stress is resulting in this fatigue, burnout syndrome and stress-related exhaustion disorder are essentially that exact same thing. They are basically saying, hey, over time, chronic stress results in fatigue and a few of these other symptoms. The same exact thing. The only difference is that these two syndromes make no specific claims about what physiological system of the body is failing and is causing these symptoms. So in other words, adrenal fatigue is saying chronic stress results in these symptoms because it is fatiguing the adrenal glands and resulting in low cortisol levels. These other syndromes are saying chronic stress results in these symptoms and you know it could be a, vari a, a variety of different physiological systems that are the mechanisms behind this. We're making no specific claims about what specific physiological system is sort of dysfunctioning that's causing this this symptom. We're just making the observation, hey, chronic stress tends to result in these symptoms. And to be clear, I am 100% on board with that. So what I'm saying, adrenal fatigue is not real. I am not saying your symptoms are not real. Your symptoms are absolutely real. What I am saying is that the research does not support the idea that it is the adrenals or your cortisol levels that are causing those symptoms. So two key differences between these conditions and adrenal fatigue. Again, number one, there's actually research on them, unlike adrenal fatigue. And number two, the conditions, again, make no claims that it is specifically this system of the body or that system of the body that's responsible for these symptoms. So guess what these studies find? When you actually look at the evidence on you know, people with stress-related exhaustion disorder or burnout syndrome or other fatigue syndromes and cortisol levels, and we have over... 79 studies that have been done on this topic. Uh, also, real quick, I will mention that I have actually done the most comprehensive review of the literature, the scientific literature that has ever been done on this subject. I have an article on my site called Is Adrenal Fatigue Real? where I have literally compiled, this is months of work, uh, I've compiled every single study that has ever been done connecting the fatigue syndromes, burnout syndrome, vital exhaustion, chronic fatigue syndrome, stress-related exhaustion disorder, every study that has ever been done looking at people with those conditions and those symptoms and cortisol levels. And I've compiled all of that, that research so you can see it all for yourself. So I have 
starting in 1995, which is basically as far back as the research goes, through 2018, I list it all out by date. Here's the names of the studies. Here's the conclusions. Also, the screenshots from the actual studies where they've measured cortisol levels. You can see this all for yourself. Again, I've done the most comprehensive review of the science that has ever been done on this topic, and I've put it all together. For your, and so you can see it all for yourself. I've even compiled the systematic literature reviews, which are the highest level of scientific evidence, where other scientists have gone through and, and, and compiled the specific research looking at cortisol levels in the context of burnout syndrome or stress-related exhaustion disorder or chronic fatigue syndrome. And I've put all of that, that research here. You know, For example, here's a table, if you're watching the video, this is a table from one of the systematic reviews where they've looked at, you know, let's looks like about a dozen studies, and they're showing you all the conflicting findings, high, low, normal, no difference between people with burnout and, and um, normal, healthy people. So you can see all of this for yourself. This is literally every study that has ever been done on this. What I'll give you right now is basically a quick summary of all of that information. So guess what these studies consistently find? A few of them find higher cortisol levels, a few of them find slightly lower cortisol levels, and the vast majority of these studies find no difference at all in cortisol levels between people with burnout syndrome or stress-related exhaustion disorder versus normal healthy people who don't have any symptoms and who are not under chronic stress. So let that sink in, no difference at all. Most people, with burnout syndrome and stress-related exhaustion disorder have perfectly normal cortisol levels that are indistinguishable from normal healthy people who don't have any symptoms, who don't have this condition, and who are not under chronic stress. So in other words, if you gave 100 cortisol test results to a functional medicine practitioner or somebody who believes in adrenal fatigue, and 50 of those test results were from normal healthy people, and 50 of them were from people who had full-blown burnout syndrome or stress-related exhaustion disorder. By looking at their cortisol test results, they would not be able to tell you who has burnout syndrome or stress-related exhaustion disorder and who is just a normal, healthy person without any chronic stress or symptoms. And that is not an exaggeration. There's actually research to support exactly what I just said. So contrary to the adrenal fatigue theory, the data definitively proves that the symptoms in these conditions are not actually caused by low cortisol levels or adrenal dysfunction. And we know that very simply because there is no adrenal dysfunction or low, low cortisol levels in the vast majority of people with these conditions. So if the vast majority of people with these conditions don't have any measurable uh, differences in cortisol levels or adrenal dysfunction, uh, there is simply no case to be made that these conditions are being caused by adrenal dysfunction or low cortisol levels. So let's do a quick thought experiment. Just imagine this hypothetical scenario. Let's imagine that many, many years ago, someone came up with a theory that type 2 diabetes was not caused by nutritional factors or lifestyle factors, but it was caused by an infection with a particular virus, let's say human herpes virus 6. And that you know, there was an elaborate, elaborate theory that was constructed around this idea that this virus could be causing this insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes. And, uh, you know, we looked at certain physiological mechanisms and logically speculating, it seemed to make some sense. And uh, the idea became very popular over a few decades. And, and tens of thousands of people then accepted this idea that human herpes virus 6 was the key cause of type 2 diabetes. And Let's imagine it became so popular that researchers started testing the idea. And over the course of 25 years, researchers all over the world in dozens of studies very directly tested whether or not people with type 2 diabetes either have this infection or have ever had this particular infection with this virus. And then let's imagine that in 90 plus percent of cases, this research consistently finds no link whatsoever between this virus and insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes. There's just no connection whatsoever, and more than 90% of people with type 2 diabetes have never had this virus at all and don't have it now. Now, what should immediately happen with this theory that this virus is causing type 2 diabetes? What would immediately happen within the scientific community? It would be discarded, and that's exactly what should happen to it because good research has consistently found over and over and over again, over many, many years and decades, that there is no link here. 
Well, this is exactly what has happened with the theory of adrenal fatigue. The only difference is that while the scientific community more broadly has already discarded this theory and there's a general consensus among actual endocrinologists and researchers in this field that adrenal fatigue does not exist, it is still broadly accepted within many holistic and alternative and functional, functional health circles. Uh, unfortunately, so there's a real gap between the actual scientific literature and common thinking on this subject. And it seems that no amount of evidence that disproves this idea of adrenal fatigue can seemingly convince people who are hardcore proponents of it. They, they've, they've set up the rules of the game such that they believe in this theory and promote this idea almost regardless of how little evidence supports it and how much evidence contradicts it. So to give you a few examples, and this is just a few of the 79 studies that I have listed out in that article I just mentioned, Is Adrenal Fatigue Real? Here's one from 2015, no alterations in cortisol profiles before and during treatment with patients with stress-related exhaustion. So in this case, very interesting study. They, they took people with stress-related exhaustion disorder, actually gave them treatment for it, got them better in many cases, and then six months later, after they have much lower levels of symptoms and they're feeling much better, then they assessed if there was any change in their cortisol levels between when they, were, had, when they had full-blown symptoms versus several months later when they're feeling much better. What they found is that there was no significant change in cortisol levels that accompanied the big change in symptoms. So, and this is one of the best kinds of studies, a longitudinal study that directly tracks the relationship of symptoms to cortisol levels, this is one of the best kinds of studies that you can use to uh, assess the connection here. So what the researchers concluded was diurnal salivary cortisol give a rather poor reflection of the prolonged stress exposure experienced by patients with exhaustion disorder. Such basal salivary cortisol measurements do not seem suitable as biomarkers for stress-related conditions as it, such as exhaustion disorder or burnout. So they're saying very directly that cortisol measurements are not suitable biomarkers for stress-related conditions such as exhaustion disorder or burnout because they can't find a link between uh, the cortisol levels and symptoms of these conditions. Another one, the neurobiology of burnout, the researchers concluded, quote, there is no HPA axis dysregulation in burnout. Another one, biomarkers in burnout, a systematic literature review. This is, again, the highest level of scientific evidence. They're taking into account all of the relevant research, in this case, on burnout syndrome. And speaking on the studies, the researcher said, quote, when taken together among all of the studies that investigated HPA axis function in burnout, and HPA axis function is hypothalamic pituitary adrenal function. So they will measure cortisol levels from the adrenals as well as uh, going upstream of that to the brain, to the hypothalamus and pituitary, and, and also looking at what's going on there. So they said when taken together among all the studies that looked at cortisol levels and burnout, three support increased cortisol levels, five support decreased cortisol levels, and 11 of the 19 studies showed no significant relationship. In other words, no difference in cortisol levels was detectable between people with full-blown burnout syndrome and normal healthy people without any of these symptoms. So the vast majority of studies in the vast majority of people find no detectable difference in cortisol levels. And the, the studies that remain that do find uh, some sort of dysfunction conflict each other. They find opposite findings. So they're not even, they're, there's no consistency at all in terms of what kind of cortisol abnormality they're finding. And uh, the, the differences when they do exist are very small, uh, either in an increased direction or a decreased direction. And again, most importantly, the vast majority of these studies and the vast majority of people show no detectable difference at all. You cannot differentiate people with full-blown burnout syndrome versus normal healthy people based on their cortisol levels. Another one, clinical burnout is not reflected in the cortisol awakening response, the day curve, or response to low-dose low dexamethasone suppression tests. So that's a way of assessing the HPA axis function. These researchers concluded that HPA axis functioning, including adrenal and cortisol levels, in clinically diagnosed burnout participants seems to be normal. This is another uh, a review of the evidence, hypocortisolism, so it's low cortisol levels and an evidence-based review. It's from several endocrinology experts. They said, quote, although adrenal fatigue or burnout of the adrenal glands subsequent to chronic stress has been proposed as one mechanism by which hypocortisolism, by which low cortisol levels develops, 
Current medical research does not support this claim. Clinicians and patients should avoid global use of this term because it underestimates the complexity of HPA axis dysfunction. Is adrenal fatigue a real condition? It is also worth mentioning the view that I am expressing here, what I am telling you about my assessment of the evidence and all of these other examples of research that I'm sharing with you, it's important to understand that this is actually not a controversial view. What, what I'm sharing with you here is actually the consensus view among medical professionals and hormone experts, endocrinology physicians, uh, about this concept of adrenal fatigue. So the Endocrine Society representing 14,000 endocrinologists who are MDs who specialize in hormonal health has publicly stated, quote, adrenal fatigue is not a real medical condition. There are no scientific facts to support the theory that long-term mental, emotional, or physical stress drains the adrenal glands and causes many common symptoms, end quote. So Something like this, you know, the, the view of conventional medical doctors and endocrinologists is often brushed off within the holistic and functional medical space. A lot of those people are saying, oh, you know, those doctors just, they, they're, they're just, you know, skeptics and hardcore scientists and they just don't understand what we understand and really adrenal fatigue is real. Well, I hope you can see now that I've actually shown you the evidence on chronic stress and chronic diseases um, and burnout syndrome and stress-related exhaustion disorder. I've shown you all these layers of evidence and whether these things are actually linked with low cortisol levels and whether there's any indication based on that research that adrenal dysfunction and low cortisol levels reliably are connected to those things. And I hope you can see now that what these doctors are saying, that there are no scientific facts to support the theory that long-term mental, emotional, or physical stress drains the adrenal glands, is absolutely 100% accurate. It is a totally accurate and intellectually honest um, interpretation of the existing evidence, and we have decades worth of evidence on that subject. It is very clear from that evidence that the science simply does not support this theory of adrenal fatigue. There's also a systematic review of the scientific literature uh, on uh, all these types of things, on stress-related exhaustion disorder, burnout syndrome, basically doing uh, exactly what I'm sharing with you here. There's a review from actual scientific researchers uh, online. It's from 2016, so it's very recent. They did a comprehensive review of basically all of the relevant scientific literature relevant to this concept of adrenal fatigue, this theory of adrenal fatigue, and what they concluded is adrenal fatigue does not exist. As of 2018, there's been another an editorial from researchers and endocrinology experts that's been published. They said, quote, current evidence does not support the existence of adrenal fatigue or the usefulness of supplements to support adrenal function. So again, going back to this sort of three-phase model of adrenal dysfunction and this whole adrenal fatigue theory and HPA axis dysfunction model, uh, as it's often sort of reframed in, in more modern functional medicine circles, the research simply does not support this idea of adrenal or HPA axis burnout and that this is central to fatigue syndromes or that it is a primary cause of fatigue or burnout or stress-related exhaustion or that it's a primary driver of chronic diseases. Now, real quick, I want to mention that what I am not saying is that that there is no such thing as true adrenal insufficiency or Addison's disease. This is a, a real medical condition, Addison's disease or adrenal insufficiency, uh, that genuinely is characterized by low cortisol levels. This is a, a, oftentimes a serious condition. It requires being on cortisone medication essentially for the rest of somebody's life. Um, and importantly, sometimes people within holistic health circles conflate adrenal insufficiency with adrenal fatigue. Um, or Addison's disease with adrenal fatigue. And this conflation is absolutely incorrect, and these things are not the same thing. Addison's disease and true adrenal insufficiency is incredibly rare, and it is not at all caused by the same things that cause low morning cortisol levels. We'll talk more about that, what actually causes low morning cortisol levels in a minute. But this conflation of true adrenal insufficiency of Addison's disease with the idea of adrenal fatigue, the theory of adrenal fatigue, is absolutely misleading and is not based on the evidence. These things are totally different things uh, caused by different things and have essentially nothing in common. Now, in the longer version of this presentation and the article, I talk about all the details of what differentiates them. But uh, to give you a very quick overview of this, I'll mention that 
one of the key differentiating factors is ACTH. This is a hormone produced by the pituitary gland uh, that acts on the adrenals to tell them to produce cortisol levels. In people with true adrenal insufficiency, what you typically see is very, very high levels of ACTH and very low levels of cortisol. So in other words, the brain is screaming at the, the adrenal glands, hey, we need more cortisol, but the adrenals are genuinely incapable of producing enough cortisol. Uh, and, and that is a very distinct pattern. So the brain is calling for more cortisol to be produced, but the adrenals cannot do it. Um, that's not always the case in Addison's. It's definitely the most common uh, scenario, but it's also possible. There's a couple other possibilities, but um, one of the, the key ways that they will determine if you have Addison's disease is what's called an ACTH stimulation test. So they will inject uh, ACTH hormone and give you a little extra boost of it. And then they assess whether your adrenal glands responded to it or not. So um, what you see in somebody who has a normal response to an ACTH stimulation test is this, this red line here, if you're watching the video, which is basically after the ACTH gets into the body, cortisol levels go up dramatically. In somebody with Addison's disease, this is what you see. You see a flat line where the cortisol levels don't respond at all. You can pump in all the ACTH you want. The adrenals cannot produce enough cortisol to respond to that. So that is a very clear way of differentiating uh, Addison's disease and true adrenal insufficiency from this, this concept of adrenal fatigue. I will also mention that there's research in people who have fatigue syndromes looking at their response to ACTH. And what they showed is, as this study is, is mentioning here, counterintuitively, the synthetic ACTH stimulation test showed a greater rise in cortisol levels in presumed sufferers from fatigue than in healthy control subjects. So they actually find that people with these fatigue syndromes respond perfectly well to ACTH. There's absolutely no indication of a deficit in the, gland, in the uh, ability of the adrenal glands to produce enough cortisol. So if it's not adrenal fatigue, then what really is going on in someone with low morning cortisol levels? So some of you are probably thinking, well, I've had cortisol level tests done and I've been shown that, that I've been told that I have low morning cortisol levels and I've been diagnosed with adrenal fatigue. So if you're saying adrenal fatigue doesn't exist, then what's really going on and how could I possibly have low cortisol levels? So indeed, what really causes low cortisol levels? Let's talk about that. So first of all, if you have low cortisol levels, here's what you really have going on. In over 90% of cases, it's not actually truly low cortisol levels that you have. It is what's called a flattened diurnal curve of cortisol levels. And more than likely, uh, in the vast majority of cases, total 24-hour output of cortisol levels uh, is still well within the normal range and probably still even perfectly normal and indistinguishable from somebody who is perfectly normal, healthy, has no chronic stress, has no symptoms of any kind. And it is just that your cortisol curve over the course of the day has changed shape a little bit. So if you measure total 24 hour output of cortisol, there isn't a difference. And why is that important? It's important because it's telling you that there isn't any actual inability of the adrenal glands to produce enough cortisol. It's that the rhythm over the course of the day has changed. So what this means, what this flattened diurnal cortisol curve means is, is basically this. So in the morning, if you're watching the video here, you can see this on the screen, but in the morning, you're supposed to see a big surge in cortisol levels. This is called the cortisol awakening response. We are meant to have much higher levels of cortisol in the morning hours. And then over the course of the day, this declines in the afternoon, it goes down, down, down in the evening, down further, and then it stays low until it comes up again the next morning. So in someone who has low morning cortisol levels and the vast majority of people who are diagnosed with adrenal fatigue, what they actually have is a flattened diurnal curve of cortisol where they just don't have as strong of a rise in morning cortisol levels. And they often have elevated levels of cortisol in the evening. Again, this is, it's just that the shape of the curve has changed, not that 24 hour output of cortisol has changed. So very important distinction there. So this is what's going on in the vast majority of people who, have, who are told that they have low cortisol levels, is that they have this flattened diurnal curve of cortisol, not truly low cortisol levels indicative of any inability of the adrenals to pump out enough cortisol. And this, this point is further made by research from Precision Analytical Lab. 
that did urinary cortisol measurements in addition to saliva cortisol measurements for over 2,000 people. And basically what they wanted to see is if the cortisol measurements in the saliva tracked with the urinary measurements. So if you measured saliva cortisol in the morning and found that somebody had low levels there, do they have low total 24 hour output of cortisol when measured via the urine? And what they found is that 85% of people actually, people, 85% of those 2000 people who had low morning salivary cortisol levels, 85% of them actually had normal or even high total cortisol production over the course of 24 hours. In other words, only 15% of people being told that they have low cortisol levels and people likely being diagnosed with quote unquote adrenal fatigue actually have low cortisol production. And even there, uh, it, it's probably, it, it's not necessarily indicative of any true inability of the adrenals to produce enough cortisol. So the point being, the vast majority of people with low morning salivary cortisol levels don't actually have any deficit in the ability of their adrenals to produce enough cortisol. And more importantly, many people being diagnosed with adrenal fatigue and being treated and told that they are, their adrenals aren't producing enough cortisol are in reality producing either perfectly normal or even abnormally high amounts of cortisol over the course of 24 hours. So there's five different mechanisms of low morning cortisol levels. I go into this in greater detail in the longer versions of this presentation and in the article. I'm gonna skip over this for the sake of brevity and we're gonna get into the actual specific causes of them. But remember, uh, just a few points. Remember that going back to what we talked about in the, in the beginning of this presentation, chronic stress, does not generally result in low cortisol levels. Number two, low cortisol levels are generally not associated with burnout syndrome or stress-related exhaustion disorder. In other words, they're not, low cortisol levels are not actually associated with the symptoms that are claimed for adrenal fatigue. Uh, and number three, the vast majority of people with low morning cortisol levels typically don't actually have any problems with their adrenals being able to produce enough cortisol. So keep in mind the big picture context of of everything that I've just talked to you about, because I'm about to tell you the true causes of low morning cortisol levels, but what I don't want you to do is confuse that as me still operating in the, the adrenal fatigue paradigm saying that, hey, you should go try to fix your fatigue by fixing your cortisol levels. Because remember, I just explained to you that it, the research makes it very clear that adrenal dysfunction or low cortisol levels are, are clearly not the main cause of fatigue and burnout and stress-related exhaustion. So it doesn't make any sense to try to fix those symptoms by putting all your time and energy into trying to fix your cortisol levels and your adrenal function. So that concludes part one of this presentation, which has been all about basically showing you the evidence that the science really does not support this idea of adrenal fatigue as being the cause of our fatigue or that chronic stress reliably leads to adrenal dysfunction and low cortisol levels, and really more broadly that the whole adrenal fatigue paradigm just is fundamentally not supported by the evidence. So in the next presentation, we're going to talk about the true causes of low morning cortisol levels. So if you are someone that has had testing done and you've actually been shown to legitimately have low morning cortisol levels, which may or may not be connected at all to any particular symptoms like fatigue. But if you have low morning cortisol levels and you want to fix that, in the next presentation, we're gonna talk about what the science says is the real factors that drive that cortisol issue and how to fix it. So I hope you enjoyed this and I'll see you in the next presentation. Hey there, this is Ari again. One more quick thing before you go. Just make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Energy Blueprint, and also make sure to subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast platform, whether that's iTunes or Stitcher or anything else. I hope you guys enjoyed this interview, and I will see you again next week.